The Undermountain, a horrifying dungeon with monstrosities beyond the wildest dreams. Forged and ruled by Halister, the Mad Mage, any adventurer's delve into this dungeon is certainly a death sentence. Perhaps you could solve its mysteries and overcome the Mad Mage. Dungeons and Dragons Waterdeep, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, is an adventure set in the Undermountain for those who prefer your classical dungeon delve. Here I will detail the events that occurs in the adventure. While it is 5th edition's version of a mega dungeon, there's more to it than just a hack and slash adventure. Smart roleplaying and quick wits may take you a long way down when exploring the Undermountain. I will try to guide you through as much of the story as I can, but please understand that this adventure is absolutely massive. Not everything will be covered as this video is nearly an hour long and it would take me ages to cover it all. That being said, I will be covering what happens at each of the levels along with a bit of the backstory. Without further ado, let's explore the story of Waterdeep, Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Undermountain Overview Over a thousand years ago, a wizard named Halister Blackcloak journeyed from a distant land to the base of Mount Waterdeep. Some believe he hailed from the nearly forgotten empire known as the Cradle Lands. Others give Halister less ancient origins, placing him among the early wizards of Netheril. Whatever his origin, scholars have recorded that Halister brought with him seven apprentices to Mount Waterdeep. With the seven guarding his back, Halister tapped into his immense power to summon beings from other planes of existence to help him build the wizard's tower to dwarf all others. As the seasons went on, the seven apprentices saw less and less of their master. Halister continued to use creatures from distant planes for construction beneath his tower, and the wizard kept the nature of most of his underground dealings a secret from the seven. Eventually, Halister's exploration broke into the underhalls, a complex of tunnels and rooms built by the dwarves around a mithril mine beneath Mount Waterdeep. The architects of the underhalls, the Malarkin clan, had long ago been killed or dispersed, and warring Duergar and Drow had settled in the ruins. Halister began a crusade against both the Drow and the Duergar, participating in wild hunts with extraplanar allies through the tunnels. The stubborn Duergars dug in until the Mithril was largely mined out, then they abandoned the Underhalls, leaving the Drow to fight Halister and his minions alone. The Mad Mage rounded up the remaining Dark Elves, trapping some of their souls for use in his dark magic while twisting the bodies and enslaving the minds of others. Once he had wrung the Drow of their usefulness, Halister Blackcloak tunneled on, ever downward, indulging in his compulsion for delving deeper and deeper into the mountain. Using his underground complex as a base of operations, Halister traveled to other plains and distant lands, collecting strange and dangerous creatures to live as prisoners, servants, or guardians in Undermountain. Over time, the mage's preoccupation with Undermountain electrified his eccentricities and infused him with an air of unconcealable madness. Halister's apprentices came and went. Some left only to return, drawn down into Undermountain's depths. Others remained by his side. As they began dedicating more attention to their private obsessions, madness settled into their souls as well. During the years, Halister quested on other planes and sequestered himself in his tunnels. His magnificent tower and its surrounding walls fell into ruin. In time, the city now known as Waterdeep developed in the shadow of Mount Waterdeep and spread down to the harbor. As the city sprawled outward over the years, it came to surround the ruins of Halister's home. Undermountain was known to those early settlers, and they often sent criminals into its endless depths as punishment. So it was for many years, until an adventurer named Durnham delved into the labyrinth beneath the tower and returned alive, laden with riches and countless harrowing tales. Durnham used his new fortune to demolish the remnants of Halister's tower and built an inn over the well he had used to descend into Undermountain, calling it the Yawning Portal. Durnan owns and operates the inn to this day, serving patrons and inviting the brave and foolish alike to test their mettle in the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Whether the allure of treasure or the strong urge to discover the dungeon's forbidden secrets, you find yourself at the Yawning Portal requesting to descend into the dungeon. Durnum, who runs the inn, charges you a mere one gold piece for your descent into the void. After paying the man, you climb down into the well in the middle of the inn and descend into the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Level 1. Dungeon Level You descend into the first level of the dungeon and find a gang of neutral evil human bandits calling themselves the Undertakers that prey on gullible adventurers. Along with them are nine bugbears that represent the Xanathar Guild, one of the most powerful criminal networks in the Sword Coast. 
The bandits are failed actors and singers who can use disguise kits to appear as vampires. These disguises are elaborate and convincing, but you can see through their ruse. The leaders of the gang, Akhtarl Kronok and Harya Velashtar, were lovers once, but their relationship soured recently. They're fed up with each other, and each is plotting to eliminate the other and take control of the gang. Varya is likely the winner of this conflict because she recently acquired a flesh goal that wandered up from the second level of the dungeon. Struck by Harya's resemblance to its creator, the golem has been pressed into service. The Undertakers demand a toll of 10 gold pieces for safe passage through this level of the dungeon. You deny their request, and the bandits ready themselves for battle. You eliminate each bandit, one by one, and clear the area of the extorting bandits. Additionally, you eliminate the bugbears and outposts left from the Xanathar Guild. Defeating the Undertakers mean that the future parties of adventurers can explore this level of the dungeon without paying tolls for safe passage. The gang's removal, however, has also allowed bugbears, goblins, were-rats, and other Xanathar Guild operatives to set up new watch posts and the bandits' former hideouts. Destroying the Xanathar Guild outpost makes this level a much safer place for a while, but also spells the end of the force that kept other predatory monsters in check. Such creatures begin to expand their territory, occasionally bumping up against one another with predictably bloody results. One thing that never changes is the steady influx of new blood from the Yawning Portal. Through your carnage of the first level, you encounter Halith, the Revenant, who was once a half-elf. Stuck in a pit, he requests your aid. He tells you that he once belonged to an adventuring party called the Fine Fellows of Daggerford. When the half-elf accused his adventuring companions of withholding treasure from him, the other members of the Fine Fellows of Daggerford beat Halith to death and threw his body into the pit. Halith awoke the next day as Revenant, compelled to find and kill the three who murdered him. Unfortunately for him, he is unable to climb out of the pit without assistance and has been pacing down there for days. You pull him up, and Halith points to a secret door in the south wall and offers to join you until he locates his friends. Together, the two of you make your way into the second level. Level 2 Arcane Chambers Descending into the second level of the dungeon, you find yourself in the Arcane Chambers. A tribe of goblins has claimed an old throne room and turned it into a bazaar. The Xanathar Guild wants to shut down the market before it attracts too many surface dwellers while the goblins fight to keep it open. Admission into the goblin bazaar is free, but non-goblinoids are closely watched. The goblin boss, Yek, recently found a magic circlet that transformed him into a human. After his initial surprise passed, Yek warmed to the transformation. After all, it made him taller. The other goblins, quietly resent taking orders from a human and would like to see Yek return to normal. After learning of the goblins' resentment to their human leader, you identify the circlet and remove it from Yek, earning the favor of the goblins. In addition to the goblins, you find more members of the Xanathar Guild. The Xanathar Guild aims to secure this level, plunder it thoroughly, and return valuable items to Skullport to be sold, thus boosting the town's sagging economy. There are two Xanathar Guild watchposts on this level, each one has a leader, a drow named Shun Spider Eyes Shurith commands the northern watch post. A human berserker named Nadia the Unbent leads the southern watch post. Werat recently stole a stone key from the southern outpost. Shun believes that the key unlocks something important and wants to reclaim it. He intends to capture Werat and ransom it for the safe return of the key. Unknown to him, a drow mage in league with the Zinterum has set up a hidden base on this level. The drow, named Rizarel, has eight were-rats in his employ. The Xanathar Guild is aware of the were-rats, but not their drow master. Rizarel has the stone key that the were-rats stole from the Xanathar Guild. He thinks it might unlock a vault hidden somewhere on this level. The drow offers to give up this key to you in exchange for the destruction of the Xanathar Guild outpost on this level. You agree to his task and proceed to each outpost, defeating the Xanathar Guild members that reside there. Along the way, you encounter the treacherous party members of Halith, Exacting his revenge, the Revenant thanks you for your aid and passes on to the afterlife. The rest of the dungeon is infested with sentient magical experiments and leftovers from the days when Halister's apprentices used this level as a laboratory. While horrifying, to say the least, most are avoidable and you traverse through them with relative ease. You make your way past the creatures of this level and climb down a set of stairs to the third level. Level 3, Sargoth Level You hear the sound of flowing water and smell the stench of seawater permeating the air. 
Along with the stench, you find the subterranean town of Stromkolder. It lies divided in chunks by ancient cave-ins that drove away its original inhabitants. This level of Undermountain is also connected to the subterranean settlement of Skullport by way of tunnels as well as the river Sargoth itself. Since then, many factions have fought over this outpost. Currently, the drow of House Avrindar and the goblinoids of the Legion of Azrock are teetering on the brink of war that Halaster and the Xanathar Guild both seek to instigate. A drow priestess of Loth named Teresa Avrindar and her retinue have assumed control of a section of Strumcalder and converted a temple once dedicated to Dumathion into a hatchery for giant spiders. Under Teresa's command, the drow have begun secret experiments using humanoids as incubators for the giant spider eggs. Eager to expunge the drow occupying his dungeon, Halister has summoned a coven of sea hags from the frigid waters of the river Sargoth. The hags have gathered followers that oppose the drow, including Grimlocks and Troglodytes. In regards to Azrock, he was the son of a hobgoblin warlord and born blind. Such a curse would ordinarily have spelled his doom in hobgoblin society, but Azrock's mother was a sorcerer and she refused to allow her son's misfortune to dictate his destiny. She crafted a dagger of blindsight, which young Azrock used to defend himself and perceive his surroundings. The dagger allowed Azrock to become the powerful soldier and leader he was fated to be, and he was quickly promoted up through the ranks until none stood above him. Other goblinoids believed he was blessed by Maglubiet, the great god of war. Azrock wisely hid the true source of his god sight to perpetuate the myth. Age granted Azrock wisdom and the desire to carve out a domain of his own. He led his forces to Stromkolder, and they rid the place of Grimlocks and Troglodytes that dwelled there. He sired an heir, ensuring that his legacy would last beyond his lifetime. His son, Azrakog, chafed at his father's sedentary nature and left to wage wars on his own, eventually returning to the Undermountain with a new name, Doomcrown, and a new purpose. The Legion of Azrak, which has lived in Stromkolder for three decades, is in turmoil. Azrak was recently forced to give up a portion of his domain to encroaching drow, and did so with nary a fight. This has sent shockwaves through his legion. What caused this strange lack of courage in their great warlord? Has age finally taken its toll? In reality, a band of Duragard thieves posing as merchants recently stole Azrock's dagger of blindsight and had fled using their invisibility. News of the death reached the drow house of Avrindar and spurred them to take over the eastern section of Stromkolder. Lurkana, Azrock's wife and strongest captain, tried to cover up her husband's blindness, but her efforts were undone by a Mind Flare acting as Skullport's ambassador. This Mind Flare secretly implanted intellect devourers in the skulls of several goblins in Azrock's court, and these goblins are spreading the truth of Azrock's blindness throughout Stromkolder to further besmirch his reputation and demoralize his troops. The hobgoblins under Azrock remain loyal to him, but many goblins and bugbears have fled to Skullport to join the Xanathar guild. Compounding Azrock and Lurkana's woes is the likelihood that the House of Rindar is planning another attack to seize more territory. Fears of a Xanathar guild offensive emerging from Skullport also play in the back of Azrock's mind. Meanwhile, Lurkana searches for aid in finding the Duergar thieves who stole the dagger of blindsight. You enter Stromkolder and are brought before Azrak and Lurkana as a manner of protocol. Azrak guarantees your safety in his settlement, and Lurkana takes you aside and offers a reward for the safe return of her husband's magic dagger. She emphasizes that without the dagger, the evading drow and the Xanathar guild might conquer Stromkolder and become immensely more powerful. She reminds you that the Legion of Azrak has never once threatened Waterdeep, but the drow or the guild might leap at the chance to do just that. Lurkana knows that the thieves who stole the dagger are Duragars of Clan Iron Eye, and she thinks that they might be hiding in Skullport. You accept her quest, and Lurkana suggests you search Skullport first and points you in the right direction. She also suggests that you speak with Skullport's ambassador to Strong Colder to see if it knows anything. She cautions you not to harm the ambassador in any way, so as not to harm any further relations. You make a quick stop to Skullport and learn that a large contingent of Duragar from Clan Iron Eye resupplied in Skullport and drank ale at a local tavern called the Black Tankard before heading deeper into the Undermountain. The tavern's tight-lipped Duragar proprietor, Druin Stonedark, denies everything. Keeping this in mind, you make your way back to the Undermountain and note that the Iron Eye clan may appear later in your journey. Learning that the drow that resides here wish to unleash a full-scale attack on Skullport, 
you eliminate some of the drows of House of Rendar to prevent the disaster. Making your way to the entrance of the fourth level, the goblinoids stationed there under the leadership of the Legion of Azeroth allows you passage as you continue your journey. Level 4, Twisted Caverns The growth of fungi along the cavernous walls of this level brings to you the sight of a beautiful yet eerily creepy cave. Here you find an abolith, the Kuatoas, and remnants of House Avrindar. Control of this level is contested between an abolith and a tribe of Kuatoa. The drow of House Avrindar watch this conflict intently, waiting to see who comes out on top before making any push of their own. Alun the abolith, along with its pet tools and enslaved troglodytes, have taken over the lake cavern and pushed the Kuatoa out. Its presence has tainted the underground river, killing off fish and other river dwellers that provide sustenance to the Kuatoa. You learn that Alun plans to take over the entire level as a step toward gaining control of Undermountain and then Waterdeep. The Abolith rarely leaves its watery lair and relies on its servants to capture new slaves. The Kuatoa on this level were pushed out of the lake cavern and away from their nesting caves by the Abolith. They have taken refuge while the Kuatoa archpriest, Nulgalu, creates an idol of the new god. The archpriest hopes the god will come to life and destroy the Abolith. Nulgalup is using random items and the body parts of various creatures to craft the idol. The Kuatua don't trust Drow and attack them on sight. When you encounter these strange beings, they request that you help bring Nulgalup's vile god to life or face the Abolith in battle. Aiming to avoid the disaster of creating a new god, you decide it would be best to just travel to the Abolith and eliminate it. The death of the Abolith allows the surviving Kuatoa to reclaim their grotto. Having saved the strange creatures, you climb onto a boat, descend further into Undermountain by following the flow of the river here. All is not well, however, as the Kuatoa victory is short-lived due to the drow attacking them soon after your descent. These attacks continue until the Kuatoa are wiped out or forced to retreat upriver. After taking over the grotto, the drow enslave the troglodytes and use them to farm fungi and crystals. Level 5, Willowwood Traversing through rapids and small waterfalls, you follow the river into the fifth level of the Undermountain. Contained within this level is a forest of trees. These temperate forests were magically created by Halister, and the sky high above you can fool anyone into thinking they have escaped Undermountain and found their way back to the surface. Birds, insects, and tree-dwelling mammals live here alongside Willowwood's fiercer denizens. The forests are real and nourished by magic, and Halister repopulates them with birds, insects, rodents, and larger mammals. The main caverns have tall ceilings hidden by illusions that can't be dispelled. The illusions flawlessly duplicate the sun, the moon, the stars, and clouds, though there is no wind or breeze to speak of. During the day, the warmth of the sun can be felt, and at night, the temperature drops as one would expect. A magic calendar stone in the area allows one to change the time of day, the weather, and the seasons in Willowwood's forest. Willow, the archdruid of the level, is the only one permitted to use the calendar stone. She is a moon elf druid with eyes as green as emeralds. Butterflies nest in her tangled black hair, and small critters gather around her feet. Over 200 years ago, Willow fell in love with Yanark, a wizard in League of Halister, and returned with him to the Undermountain. Her happiness faded quickly when the dungeon proved to be a far cry from the woods she called home. Determined to keep Willow in the Undermountain, Halister used several wish spells to create a magical forest for her, but even this gift wasn't enough to offset the druid's languor. When Yanark forbade her from ever returning to the surface, Willow grew positively despondent. The relationship soured and turned violent. A volley of spells on both sides resulted in Yanark's death. After Willow's fury abated, all that remained was undying grief and encroaching madness. She remains in Undermountain in accordance with Yanark's wishes, a prisoner of her own guilt. Undermountain is Willow's home now, and all memory of the surface world has faded from her mind. She is distant, but kind towards those who pass harmlessly through her domain, but turns violent whenever her force or its peaceful denizens are threatened. Willow's displacer beast companion, Crisson, is named after a human mercenary whom the elf befriended many years ago. Before this relationship could blossom into a romance, Halister intervened and used this magic to turn Willow's new friend against her. The heartbroken druid slew Crisson in the woods and vowed never to let another mortal touch her heart so deeply. Willow has conflicted feelings about Halister. 
She is grateful to him for providing her a home and keeping Willowwood alive with his magic, but she blames him for Yanard's death. She also pities him, for the Mad Mage too appears to be trapped in a prison of his own making. Willow believes he is no longer human, but an immortal entity composed of pure magic. Thus, she has given up any hope of being rid of him. In addition to Willow, hidden within these trees is a young green dragon named Tyrolai. This green dragon, once a lawful evil creature, experienced a change in alignment and personality when an adventurer impaled it through the skull with a sentient, emerald-bladed sword of sharpness named Tyrolai. The dragon now refers to itself as Tyrolai and has the long sword's neutral good alignment. It sleeps atop a platform overlooking the River of Deaths, guarding its treasure. Willow once sent adventurers against the green dragon, hoping to destroy the evil dragon, but the dragon's change of alignment caused Willow to reconsider their relationship. Now that the green dragon and Tyrolai are one, the Archdruid considers the dragon part of Willowwood's ecosystem. The two currently enjoy a peaceful coexistence. South of Willow's Tower stands a large complex of ornate stone buildings that used to be the home to a cult of Malar, the Beast Lord. Willow allowed these evil humans to hunt in her forest, but they abused the privilege, so the Archdruid and her green dragon ally eradicated the cultist. The village stood empty for years until a congregation of goblin werebats took residence in the caves around the buildings. The werebats prefer the caves to the structures, which have largely remained abandoned. Willow allows the werebats to feed on any stray vermin and adventurers. They wisely acknowledge the Archdruid as masters of the forest and leave her animals and her dragon ally alone. As you explore the forest, you meet Willow and tell her of your journey deeper into the Undermountain. The friendly druid shows you the two passages, one that leads down to the 6th level and another that leads into the 7th. She warns you to steer clear of the werebats and show the green dragon the respect it's due. Heeding Willow's words, you make your way past the werebat caves and into the tunnel. Level 6, Lost Level As you trek through the tunnels, you note the strange markings on the walls that are eerily similar to the markings of an Umber Hulk. The end of the tunnel leads you to a massive temple complex that was once dedicated to the dwarven god Dumathion, known as the Lost Level. Until recently, the Lost Level was physically cut off from the rest of the Undermountain, but when the Umber Hulks burrowing through the mountain stumbled upon it, they left tunnels in their wake for treasure hunters to follow. Hidden inside is the Tomb of Malar, king of the Malarkin dwarves that once resided in the Undermountain before the conquest of Halaster. The Duergar of Clan Iron Eye, led by a half Duergar prospector named Skella Iron Eye, have come to plunder this level of Undermountain. They are assisted in this effort by two cloakers from the Conclave on level 5, which hope to turn this level into a hunting ground. After gaining entry through an Umber Hulk tunnel that leads down from level 5, the raiders manage to loot several rooms. But a combination of traps and unexpected monsters has diminished their numbers and dimmed their enthusiasm. Skella is obsessed by artistry and beauty, in stark contrast to the unusual Duergar focus on utility. The Duergar she leads are content to follow her for the sake of what their raids will earn them, and they care nothing for the historical value of the relics they steal and destroy. Skella is willing to parlay with you and stay out of your way in exchange for a chance to plunder more of the dungeon and leave in one piece. Her lawful nature means she will abide by the terms of any bargain. While certainly a good deal to be had, you remember the request to return the dagger stolen from Azrock and Strum Colder by Clan Iron Eye. You battle with the clan and slay the Duergar, taking their looted treasure along with the dagger. Keeping in mind to return the dagger back to Azrock once the Undermountain has been explored, you set forth into another set of Umberhulk tunnels and into the seventh level. Level 7 Mad God's Castle the tunnel barreled by the Umber Hulks takes you to a system of caverns that all leads towards the large room in the center. Within this large room, you find a miniature 112 scale fortress. This castle serves as the home base of Madgoth, a serial killer who lures other wizards to his lair to murder them and keep their arcane focuses and spellbooks as trophies. Madgoth isn't home when you first arrive. Madgoth comes and goes from Undermountain with the aid of a horned ring similar to one worn by Halister. While he is away, his homunculus watches over the castle. A fairy dragon has also discovered the castle and claimed it as his lair. To reach the castle, you travel through caverns inhabited by a family of forgetful stone giants. Ten years ago, Halister lured a family of stone giants to Undermountain and stripped them of most of their memories. 
The giants remember who they are, and can recall events that happened within the last 8 hours, but everything that occurred before then is lost in a haze and soon forgotten. All their memories of the surface world and its inhabitants faded long ago. The stone giants are irritable and self-serving, but not evil. They are unaware of the miniature castle and the heart of their domain because it floats in the middle of a great cavern beyond the range of their dark vision. The giants are tormented by the fairy dragon that layers in Madgoth's castle. It emerges while invisible and uses illusion spells to close off passages, create false tunnels, and make temporary alterations to the giants' caves. The fairy dragon's mischief has only heightened the stone giant's irritability, and the giants, having never seen the creature, suspect that you might be responsible. To earn the giant's trust, you must seek out the fairy dragon and put an end to it. Approaching the fortress, you are reduced to one twelfth of your normal size as you approach Madgoth's castle, enabling you to fit better inside. Either by design or because of some failing, the shrinking magic doesn't affect all creatures. The violet fairy dragon named Otto was drawn here by the magic that Halister wove into these caves. Upon discovering Madgoth's castle, Otto decided to move in. The fairy dragon was unaffected by the castle's shrinking magic and settled comfortably into its new home. It feeds on bats and other vermin it finds in the surrounding cavern. When it's bored, the fairy dragon sneaks out invisibly and uses its spells to make illusionary modification to the stone giant's caves, confounding the giants for its own amusement. The giants have no clue who or what is responsible for this magical mischief. The fairy dragon would like to get rid of Madgoth's homunculus, which has been a troublesome reminder of the castle's true owner. Otto has defeated the homunculus in physical combat more than once, but it keeps coming back. The dragon has concluded that the only way to get rid of the homunculus for good is to forcibly remove it from the castle and trap it somewhere else. If you do this for the fairy dragon, in exchange, Otto will allow you to use this castle for rest and relaxation, provided you don't overstay your welcome or loot the joint. In Madgoth's study, you find a room ravaged by that of the homunculus. Your arrival prompts the homunculus to begin rooting through the mess on the floor. After a minute of searching, it finds a torn page, on which is drawn a smiling dragon with butterfly wings. The homunculus shows it to you, tears the page into tiny pieces, throws the scrap into the air like confetti, and gives you a long stare. The fact that the homunculus hasn't perished suggests that Madgoth is still alive, but their telepathic bond has been severed, indicating that the two are no longer on the same plane of existence. Whether this separation is of Madgoth's choosing is unknown. The lonely homunculus longs to be reunited with his creator. It also wants to rid Madgoth's castle of the fairy dragon that has invaded it. Whether to dispatch the fairy dragon or the homunculus, the choice is yours. What happens in the miniature castle has little impact on the stone giants and vice versa. Killing all the giants would sadden Otto, the fairy dragon, but its goals don't change. If you help the giants by dealing with the fairy dragon, all is forgotten within a few hours when the giants' memories fade away. Whatever the outcome may be, it ends with you walking past a cavern containing a petrified basilisk and making it onto the 8th level. Level 8, Slither Swamp Having passed the strange fortress in the 7th level, you are greeted with the sight of murky waters. This level consists of muck-filled caverns and decaying temples dedicated to evil deities of the Yuan-Ti. The serpent folk lived here until they were defeated by Nagas, known as the Sethian Scourges. Afterward, Halaster replaced the Yuan-Ti with a bullywug tribe governed by a cruel death slot overlord. The Sethian Scourge were three spirit Nagas that fought the Yuan-Ti of the Slither Swamp, eventually claiming victory. Only two spirit Nagas remain, Exgrutha and Serakath, along with their thralls and the remnant of the third spirit Naga, Hexakali, who was destroyed and transformed into a bone naga by the Yuan-Ti. The spirit nagas maintain a stable of thralls and use a rod of rulership to ensure their obedience. Every day at dawn, the nagas gather their thralls and target them again with the recharge rod, and each naga has the special ability to increase the duration of the charm effect. Humanoid thralls that resist the rod's magic often choose to maintain the appearance of being charmed for the sake of their own survival because the nagas kill or chain up those they can't magically enslave. Shortly after the Sethian Scourges defeated their Yuan-Ti foes, a tribe of Bullywugs left by a death slod appeared in the Slither Swamp. Frustrated by this new obstacle in their dominance of the level, the Nagas now seek allies to slay the Bullywugs and their leader. A year ago, Halastern used his magic to transport the Black Tongue tribe of Bullywugs, along with its small army of giant frogs and giant toads, from a remote marshland to this level of the Undermountain. 
He seeded them into those parts of Slither Swamp once controlled by the Yuan Ti. The Bullywergs were quick to capture and domesticate four carrion crawlers and Hydra. Halaster also summoned a death slot named Kuketh to Slither Swamp. The Mad Mage keeps the slot's control gem in his sanctuary and forces Kuketh to serve as the Bullywogs' king. The Black Tongues live in fear of their new king. The slot hates being under Halaster's control and takes out his frustration on its subjects. The Mages of Demacor, an organization found on the ninth level, have sent one of their own, a human named Karstis, to monitor this level. He is an ally to those looking to thin out any of the factions in Slither Swamp, but a foe to anyone who tries to gain access to Demacor. Here you have the option of helping Kukath and the Black Tongue Tribe, or the Sethian Scourge. If you help Kukath destroy or reclaim its control gem, the Death Slot abandons the Bullywogs. If all the Black Tongue Bullywogs are defeated, the temple becomes a safe place for you to rest. Killing the Sethian allowed the Black Tongues to overrun the Naga's cave. Karstis and the Mages of Demacor might be there already though, wanting to hold those caverns. Such gains are short-lived because the Spirit Naga's rejuvenation trait ensures their return in a few days. Regardless of the results, you press on past a warded cavern and continue on to the ninth level in the Undermountain. Level 9, Demacor. Having traveled through jungles and swamps, you've seen it all when it comes to exploring a dungeon. Regardless, you weren't expecting to find an Academy of Magic at the end of the cavern. Demacor is an Academy of Magic designed to test, trap, and confound its students. An Arcanaloth and a Night Hag preside over this level. The Arcanaloth, in league with the Mad Mage, runs Demacor's Academy of Evil Mages. It keeps its true name secret and uses Alter Self spells to appear as Halister. The Arcanaloth employs Nykaloth and Mesoloth as guards, and it trades safe passage through Demacor for magic items. Evil mages in search of arcane knowledge or Halister's tutelage come here with their followers to train and be tested. Wormriddle is a night hag who has four flesh golems at her command. She strikes foul bargains, offering spells and secrets of magic in exchange for evil acts that allow her to claim souls. The night hag wears a mummified kitten's head around her neck as a talisman, though it has no magical properties. It testifies to her fear of cats, for Wormriddle is frightened while there's feline creatures within her sight. You become embroiled in academy politics and form tenuous truces with certain students while making enemies of others. The loss of one or more students has little effect on the day-to-day -day affairs of Demacor, since the facility has no emotional attachments to the pupils. Within a 10-day, the headmaster replaces dead students with new arrivals and begin their orientation. Finding a secret door set into a wall, you push it open to reveal a corridor. Following the corridor brings you to a stone staircase that descends onto the next level. Level 10, Murals Gauntlet. Descending the staircase, you are greeted by a network of rooms that are a pale shadow of their former glory, having fallen into disrespair and neglect. Mural the Mishappen, one of Halister's apprentices, claimed this drow-built level as his private hunting ground after the Dark Elves were forced to abandon it long ago. Despite being recruited by Halister as a bodyguard, Mural also studied magic under the Mad Mage. He is no longer human, having grafted his upper torso onto the body of a giant scorpion. With no hope of repelling the drow on his own, and no help coming from Halister, Mural does his best to hold on to what he has left. Under the leadership of a priestess named Vlonwelv Avrindar, the drow have recently returned to reclaim the level. House Avrindar and its allies hope to establish a permanent stronghold here, complete with a fully renovated temple dedicated to Lolth. The house uses Mural's Gauntlet as a staging ground for raids into other levels and as a base from which to launch attacks against House Freth, a rival drow house that has a fortress on the 12th level. Leading them is Vlonwelv Avrindar. Vlonwelv is the mother to Teresa, who was encountered on the third level. The priestess is a diplomat through and through. Although angered by your presence in her fortress, she treats you cordially at first, offering you food, drinks, shelter, and safe passage. In return, she demands that you hunt down and slay Mural, who has become an unwelcome distraction. If you refuse, she threatens you with death. Eliminating Mural or Vlonwelv are options you can take, or you may decide to avoid them altogether. Whichever option you may choose, you eventually make your way out of the facility and enter a natural cavern that descends to the 11th level. Level 11, Troglodyte Warrens. 
The passage from the drow stronghold leads you to a reeking cavern. Troglodyte inhabit this level of the Undermountain. Their dominance is contested by drow, determined to enslave them, trolls twisted by Halister's magic, and a magically enhanced Bahir intent on terrorizing all. Drow from House Avrindar on the 10th level and House Freth on the 12th level are fighting each other for control of this level, all the while capturing troglodytes to use as slaves and doing their best to steer clear of the Bahir. Houses Avrindar and Freth continue to send forces to this level until their strongholds are destroyed. Making it past the Bahir takes a bit of luck, but eventually you make it through and onto the 12th level. Level 12, Maze Level Having escaped the hellish landscape of the previous level, it seems like the Drows of House Freth are battling more than you had expected. This level is known as the Maze Level and is a battleground between the Drow of House Freth and a tribe of Minotaurs. The Minotaurs hold sway over a maze of tunnels riddled with magical effects and traps, while the Drow occupy the caves around an elegant fortress called Spiderwatch Keep, a staging ground for House Freth's goals of conquering all of the Honor Mountain. Hostilities between the Drow and the Minotaurs have recently abated in the wake of devastating losses on both sides. Driven Freth, a Drow Archmage, hopes to use this respite to his house advantage by summoning a Garistro demon that will force the Minotaurs to submit to House Freth's control. From their Dark Bastion, the leaders of House Freth strive to keep their enemies, House Avrindar, from conquering the 11th level, the Troglodyte Warrens. Leading the effort is Irolal Freth, a drow priestess of Loth. Her older brother, Driven, works at her side. Irolal has communed with Loth and believes that the key to securing the troglodyte warrens begins with the capture of the Minotaurs on this level. Once the Minotaurs are subservient to House Freth, the drow will use them to clear out and secure the warrens. To this end, Driven is devising a ritual to summon and control a Garistro demon. By passing the Garistro off as Baphomet, the Lord of Minotaurs, he hopes to win the Minotaurs' obedience. But Driven has recently realized that his arcane knowledge is not sufficient to allow him to perfect the ritual, and he's afraid of admitting his inadequacy to his sister. 23 Minotaurs inhabit the southern half of the maze level. They spend most of their time fighting the drow. Their leader is a priest of Baphomet named Maku, a devout follower of the Horned King who has tried to summon the Demon Lord on numerous occasions. The Minotaur priest believes that his ritual will be successful if he can amass a large enough pile of mutilated corpses for the Demon Lord to feast on. Additionally, Tendra Nightblade and Mateen Shadowdusk, two low-ranking members of the Shadowdusk family that resides in the 22nd level of the Underdark, arrived at Spiderwatch Keep a few days ago. They claimed to be emissaries from Shadowdusk Hold who were seeking an alliance from House Freth. The two diplomats have been feted and flattered by Irolai Freth since they arrived. The Drow Priestess recognizes the potential benefit of an alliance, although she is also trying to ascertain whether Shadowdusk Hold has made similar overtures to House Avrindar. What Irolal doesn't realize is that House Shadowdusk has no interest in an alliance, and the two emissaries have come to the maze level on a secret mission. Beholden to Halister, the Shadowdusk have been ordered to convince Driven Freth to accept an apprenticeship under the Mad Mage. They have secretly informed him of Halister's intent and of Halister's offer to help him perfect the ritual that will bind a Garistro to House Freth's service. They now wait for Driven's decision while doing everything they can to ensure that he makes the right choice. Sneaking past the strange politics that inhabited the current and previous floors, you make your way to a hold that leads to the 13th level. Eerily enough, the hole resembles that created by a purple worm. Delving in, a monstrosity awaits you on the other side. Level 13, Trobrian's Graveyard It may be due to unfortunate circumstances, but your delve into the tunnel of the worm happened to coincide with the mindless travel of the Boar Worm, a drilling machine that was modeled after a purple worm. The piercing sound of drilling fills your ear long before you see it, but is certainly a sight to behold. It is a metal-plated behemoth that resembles a purple worm, replacing the skin with metal sheets and mouth with a grinding drill. Its creator, Chobrian, known as the Metal Mage. This level serves as his workshop, testing ground, and junkyard. Chobrian himself is an infrequent visitor, preferring instead to remain close to his master, Halister. The Metal Mage's magical constructs populate this level. Among them lives a gnome named Zox Clamorsham. As a clever rock gnome, 
Zox is the sole survivor of his former party's failed Undermountain expedition. Since the demise of his friends, Zox has managed to secure a ring that allows him to command the Skalader. He has put the constructs to work, building a device he calls the Simulacrux. This device will, in theory, create a simulacrum of any Skalader that passes through it. Zox's intentions are not malevolent, he simply needs more Skalader in order to build things he wishes. The bounty of salvage on this level has not gone unnoticed by the fire giants on the 14th level. They send hobgoblin minions to steal scrap metal, which the giants are using, to build a great construct of their own. The hobgoblins raid in small bands, using trained rust monsters to distract Zox's constructs. These raiders are naturally violent, but can be parlayed with. The hobgoblins recently figured out how Zox controls the Skalader, and now they aim to kill the gnome and take his control ring. So far, Zox has managed to elude all the hobgoblins sent to murder him. You may detour from the tunnels and interact with Zox and the hobgoblins, or collect some scrap metal to claim as your own. In the end, all roads lead back to the worm tunnels in which you follow down into the 14th level. Level 14, Arcturia Doom. The worm tunnel deposits you into a dungeon housing a truly evil being. The lich, Arcturia, who dwells on the lowest level of the Undermountain, is one of Halister's most accomplished apprentices, arguably the most powerful of the seven, and a master of transmutation magic. Arcturia Doom is her personal retreat, Doom being an archaic term for a lord's domain. Hidden on this level is Arcturia's phylactery. Arcturia Doom has been taken over by fire giants in the service of Halister. Emberosa, a fire giant, has come to Undermount with six of her kin on a mission to raise fire giants to the top of the giant ordning dethroning the mighty storm giants. Emberosa hopes to obtain a lost ruin of power created by the giants more than 40,000 years ago. She believes Dwarves stole the rune from the giants and hid it under Mount Waterdeep. Halister found the rune and hid it on the 23rd level, but he has agreed to part with it if the fire giants use their exceptional metal forging abilities to build a giant construct for him. The fire giants are accompanied by a large force of hobgoblins. The force of hobgoblins came to Undermountain along with Emberosa and her fire giants. This force is commanded by a hobgoblin warlord named Doomcrown, who is the son of warlord Azrock, found on the third level. Doomcrown wants fire giants to ascend to the top of the giant ordning, envisioning their brutal tyranny sweeping across Faerun. He expects to play an important role in Emberosa's conquest, and he dreams of ruling what remains of the high forest once the elves and other forest denizens are purged and the trees are reduced to ash and spines. Since arriving in Arcturia Doom, however, Doomcrown has developed strange habits. He spends more and more time locked away in his quarters chasing some strange new obsession. His followers remain loyal, but they worry about the mental state of their warlord. You go through the level, defeating Emberosa and obtaining Arcturia's phylactery. Through a bit of investigation and some personal knowledge, you learn that the object can only be destroyed after being digested in the stomach of a mimic for 30 days. You take it with you and destroy the phylactery whenever you have a chance. Destroying this phylactery leaves Arcturia with no means to rejuvenate once her physical form is destroyed. Additionally, defeating Emberosa and her fire giants stalled the progress on Halister's creation, but only until Halister finds new metalsmiths to continue the work. Opening a door in the dungeon, it leads you to a staircase that descends hundreds of feet to the 15th level. Level 15, Obstacle Course Upon entering the 15th level of the Undermountain, you find a magical mouth next to some minecarts that speak to you. Welcome to the obstacle course. Place all weapons and magic items in the carts for safekeeping. You won't need them. Hurry, time is running out! This is the voice of Halister, and you've just entered his obstacle course. As a visitor to this level, you must contend with mechanical traps left behind by the Milarkin Dwarves, magical traps crafted by the Mad Mage, and an undead beholder named Netherskull. Many years ago, a beholder floated up from the Underdark and infiltrated Undermountain. After carving out a layer for itself, the beholder dreamed itself into undeath, becoming a death tyrant called Netherskull. When Halister and Netherskull met in battle, the wizard emerged triumphant, but he couldn't bring himself to destroy such a formidable dungeon guardian. Instead, Halister agreed to let Netherskull remain the undisputed lord of this level on the condition that it permit Halister to tinker with and maintain the level's traps, as well as add a magical, mean-spirited announcer that taunts visitors as they blunder from one room to another. 
this magical voice narrates things similar to that of a sports commentator, spouting things such as, swing and a miss, and ouch, that'll leave a mark. During your run of the obstacle course, you also encounter trouble from the elemental planes of earth and fire, and a band of Githzerai are I on a special mission. Several lava children, brought to Undermountain by Halister's apprentice Trobriand, have migrated from the 13th level to the obstacle course and have taken residence around a lava-filled chasm in the heart of the level, joining the magma methods that dwell there. Nether Skull terrorizes the lava children magma methods from time to time, but not enough to force them to leave the warmth of the chasm. The evil methods trick or goad the lava children into attacking all other creatures that blunder into their territory. Four Githzerai Zerths have taken refuge in the obstacle course, then use their psychic abilities and natural stealth to hide from Halster's magical gaze and the Death Tyrant's watchful eyes. The Githzerai are aware that the Gith Yankee have conquered the Crystal Labyrinth on the 16th level and are waging war against a Mind Flare colony on the 17th level. The Githzerai wait patiently to see the outcome of the conflict between the two, but stand ready to assist should the Gith Yankee need help. The leader of the Githzerai in this level, Irlaka, is a member of the Shasal Ko a faction of renegade Gith Yankee and Gith Zerai who seek to reunify the Gith race. By helping the Gith Yankee defeat a common foe, Erlaka hopes to demonstrate the merits of a single unified Gith race, not only to the evil Gith Yankee, but also to younger Gith Zerai's Earths who follow him. Erlaka is concerned because his most headstrong pupil, a Gith Zerai named Ezria, has disappeared. He fears that Ezria was captured by the Gith Yankee in the Crystal Labyrinth while trying to find weak spots in their defenses. While a bit tough, the obstacle course poses no match for you and you clear the level, vanquishing those who stand in your way. Although most of the obstacle course's remaining inhabitants have no intention of leaving anytime soon, the Gith Sarai stay only as long as they must to reunite with their missing comrade and ensure the destruction of the Mind Flare colony. Walking past the statue of Halister, you descend down a sloping tunnel that leads to the 16th level. Level 16, Crystal Labyrinth. A crystal golem is what greets you at the end of the tunnel in the entrance of the 16th level, the Crystal Labyrinth. It protects the Gith Yankee that reside here from those who would threaten them. The Gith Yankee recently turned the Crystal Labyrinth into an outpost of their interplanar empire. It houses a gate to Stardog, a hollowed out asteroid in orbit around the planet Toral, one of many that form the asteroid cluster known as the Tears of Selphine. An adult red dragon named Ash Tyranthor defends Starduck as well. The Gith Yankee, tracking a splinter colony of Mind Flayers to Undermountain, seized this level and turned what was once a crystalline maze into a fortress. From here, they launch attacks against the Mind Flayers on the 17th level. The Gith Yankee also transforms Starduck into a crache, a fortress dedicated to raising and training young warriors. Because creatures do not age on the astral plane, the Gith Yankee must bring their offspring to the material plane to mature. Unfamiliar with the asteroid's actual name, the Gith Yankee referred to Starduck as Crache Kalur. The Gith Yankee are led by Alkea, a knight who is cruel to her trainees and soldiers. Alkea recently acquired a manual of gainful exercise in a tomb of clear thought, and she has promised to award both items to her most accomplished soldier. In truth, she plans to read these tomes to gain their benefits herself, but uses the promise of this reward to trick her troops into running themselves ragged. Alkea's second in command, Urion, is tired of the abuse and plots against her. Whether you decide to engage the alien race and infiltrate their asteroid base, or proceed on your way past them, you end your journey of the 16th level by slipping down some tunnels located beyond two crystal golems. Level 17, Sea Deeps. The natural tunnel you traverse through levels out before splitting into several passages. Navigating these tunnels, you occasionally come across the body as a flumps slain by the Gith Yankee in the floor above. Something surely strange in these parts of the dungeon. Deep in the Underdark, a Gith Yankee vanguard force attacked a large colony of Mind Flayers controlled by an Elder Brain. Fearing the colony's destruction, the Elder Brain instructed his most loyal vassal, an Olitharid called Extrematon, to establish a splinter colony somewhere else safe from the Gith Yankee's incursions. Extrematon made its way to Undermountain with a group of Mind Flayers, laid claim to the 17th level of the dungeon, and began fortifying it against attacks from the Gith Yankee and others. 
The dungeon's proximity to Waterdeep guaranteed the Mind Flayers an endless supply of brains to feed on, while Undermountain's existing defenses offered an unmatched level of security. Extrematon has built an enormous dynamo that channels the energy of an underground river to power a series of interconnected metal capsules called Psipods. The Illithids under Extrematon's command have kidnapped humanoids and put them to sleep in these capsules, which link their dreaming minds to the Illitharid's dizzying intellect. These captives believe they're in Waterdeep, but the city they see and experience around them is a fabrication. Within this alternate reality of Waterdeep, Extrematon appears as any character it wants. Its favorite role is to play that of Durnum, the gruff, tight-lipped proprietor of the Yawning Portal. Through methods unknown to the Illithids, the Gith Yankee Vanguard Force tracked the survivors of their attack on the colony to Undermountain. Having recently secured the nearby 16th level, the Gith Yankee now wage war against the Mind Flayers and Sea Deeps. Uncertainty about its own future has forced Extrematon to hold off on transforming into an Elder Brain. Instead, it is focused on defending the colony and destroying the Gith Yankee neighbors. With only a dozen Mind Flayers remaining under its rule, Extrematon has resorted to breeding a Neothalid and plans to set it loose in the Crystal Labyrinth to finally wipe out the Gith Yankee force. Killing Extrematon would deprive the surviving Illithids of their leader, forcing them to disappear into other corners of Undermount or return back to the Underdark. If the Gith Yankee are wiped out and Extrematon is allowed to live, it eventually turns itself into an Elder Brain, which attracts more Illithids to the colony. Whichever path occurs, you eventually descend another sloped tunnel that is guarded by two Duergars. Level 18, Van Rack Doom. Exiting the tunnel from the 17th level, you encounter a tall corridor of smooth worked stone in the beginning of the 18th level, Van Rack Doom. The level is named after Van Rack Moonstar, a Water Davian noble who turned to the worship of Shar. He descended into Undermountain and became a Death Knight. To grasp what's happening on this level and why, one needs to know the fate that befell Lord Moonstar. Adherents of Shar have been active in the shadow of Mount Waterdeep ever since a disastrous expedition to the Black Jungles by Lord Vanrock Moonstar, a charismatic outgoing swashbuckler. Vanrock was but a pale shadow of his former self when he returned. A few ten days later, his father, Lord Anvaron Moonstar, died of a strange wasting disease that could not be cured by healing magic. Upon assuming leadership of House Moonstar, Vanrak publicly broke with the Temple of Saloon, the Goddess of the Moon, which he blamed for his father's untimely death. Consumed with bitterness, the Dark Ranger, as Vanrak came to be known, secretly embraced Saloon's sister, Shar. After some years, House Moonstar was in open schism. Family members who still venerated Saloon aligned themselves with Lord Vanrak's sister, Lady Alethine. Meanwhile, Lord Vanrak and his followers extended their dark influence over much of the city's harbor with the aid of a small army of mercenaries bolstered by followers of Shar. Lady Alethine appeared in open court and asked the Lords of Waterdeep to strip her brother of his title and banish him from the city for his multiple crimes such as slavery and murder. The Lords ordered the immediate capture of the Dark Ranger, but by the time the City Watch had breached the gates of this villa, Vanrak and his followers had already fled through a secret portal into Undermountain. He and his followers remained there until they conquered the level of Undermountain that came to be known as Vanrak Doom. Operating from his new base, Vanrak extended his influence throughout much of Undermountain and even periodically dispatched elite strike teams to battle followers of Saloon in the city above. He achieved his most dramatic success when his followers infiltrated the High House of Stars through its cellar, slaughtered most of the inhabitants before they could raise an alarm, engulfed the temple in black fire, and burned it to the ground. The invaders also acquired enough treasure from the temple vault to fund Lord Vanrick's personal quest for immortality. Within a few years, the Dark Ranger has transformed himself into a Death Knight. The Lords of Waterdeep hired ways of adventures to descend into Undermountain to bring Vanrak and his followers to justice. Although none of these adventurers succeeded, they winnowed down Vanrak's army to the point where he could no longer threaten the city. Halaster compounded Vanrak's woes by urging other Undermountain dwellers to invade Vanrak Doom from time to time. In a desperate move, the few remaining priests of Shar performed rituals to harness the despair of Vanrak's shadow dragon mount on Braxicar and use him to transport Van Rakdoom into the Shadowfell. In the end, Halister's magical hold over Undermountain proved too strong to overcome, yet a small section of Van Rakdoom crossed over into the Plane of Shadow and became its gaunts there. Confronted by failure, Vanrak came to believe that Shar had deceived him 
and had orchestrated his downfall solely to spite her nemesis, Saloon. In the following years, he renounces faith in Char and begs Saloon's forgiveness for the destruction of her temple and its followers. In a desperate act of redemption, the Death Knight destroyed his undead form using a sunblade. A vampire cleric of Char, named Carista Delvingstone, has ruled Van Doom ever since. Carista Delvingstone grew up in the streets of Waterdeep and is no stranger to hardship. Hoping to make a better life for herself, she became an adventurer and sought fame and fortune in the Undermountain. Caresta met her end in the lair of a vampire and became a vampire spawn under his command. After Vanrak destroyed the vampire and conquered his lair, he took Caresta under his wing. Consumed by darkness and loss, Caresta was drawn to Shar like a moth to a flame and rose to become a vampire cleric of the evil god. She now leads Shar's debased cult in Vanrak Doom and intends to send the group on a mission to destroy the spires of the morning, the Temple of Lathander in Waterdeep. She also has her sights set on destroying Waterdeep's Temple of Saloon, whom she blames for the destruction of Vanrak Moonstar. The history of this level is rich, but to you, it's just another floor to traverse through. You sneak past shadow creatures, vampires, and agents of Carista's army to a tunnel that seems centuries old. Traveling down, the air moistens as humidity begins to build. Level 19, Cavern of Ooze. Your trek down into the 19th level brings you to the Cavern of Ooze, where you find a cavernous ecosystem filled with primordial ooze. Here you find a spell jamming vessel and its crew, followers of an evil god of oozes, and two genies competing among one another. A Dao and a Mered live here, having struck bargains with Halister to rid of the Lich, as it, that resided in the 20th level. The genies compete with one another. Whichever one obtains the Lich's phylactery wins its freedom, damning the other to spend the remainder of its existence in Undermount. By the rules of Halister's game, the genies can use adventurers to get the job done, but they can't cause bodily harm to one another, either directly or indirectly. A disgruntled mud method named Erm has been forced to act as the genie's go-between. Additionally, the Mad Mage captured a space-faring pirate ship called the Scavenger, stole the magic device that propels it, and left a derelict vessel and its crew to rot in the Caverns of Ooze. The ship's Mind Flayer captain was forced to eat the brains of several shipmates to survive. The remainder of the crew fled into the caverns having taken refuge in the Oozefield Caverns around the ship. Now the Illithid waits for new humanoid brains to deliver themselves into its waiting tentacles. The Caverns of Ooze have at various times served as a temple and sanctuary for worshippers of Ganader, the evil god of oozes, slimes, and other subterranean horrors. Halister rewards these mad zealots by transforming them into oozes that retain most of their memories and intelligence. These servants of Ganader believe the god himself has blessed them. The mad mage does nothing to discourage this impression. Followers of Ganader, whom Halister lures to Undermountain, invariably visit a floating orb that weeps primordial ooze. The orb is thought to be part of Ganader himself. His worshippers sometimes refer to the object as the Weeping Eye. In truth, Alistair found the oozing orb and brought it here solely to flood the caverns and mislead Ganader's vile devotees. Your time here is brief as you make it past the abominations that dwell here and proceed onwards to the lair of the Lich that resides in the 20th level of the Undermountain. Level 20, Runestone Caverns Throughout your journey of Undermountain, you've encountered many that have been under the control of Halister, some more willing than others. Your arrival into the 20th level brings you to the Runestone Caverns, here of which houses the Lich that wishes to usurp the Mad Mage. The Runestone is a large magic crystal created by Halister Blackcloak that is embedded in the top of a huge hollowed out stalagmite that rises from the center of this level's main cavern. This spire serves as the lair of a Lich named Ezzet who has long been Halister's enemy. Ezzet has become obsessed with destroying Halister and usurping his control over Undermountain. As his mania and thirst for power grows, the Lich becomes more like Halister with each passing day. In an effort to destroy Ezzet, Halister created a legion of stone golems called Stone Cloaks, modeled after himself, placing a fragment of the runestone in each one to imbue it with more intelligence and personality. When Ezzet learned what Halister was up to, the Lich placed wards on the stalagmite tower to prevent Construct from assailing it. This countermove prompted Halister to abandon his golems and stop making new ones. Having witnessed the mayhem that Halister has created within this dungeon, it may be wise to end Esset before he replaces the Mad Mage. You may decide to destroy the Lich, especially if you made a deal with the genies on the 19th level. 
but doing so will allow the Mad Mage to place an apprentice of his here to rule over this level. Perhaps it'd be wise to allow the Lich to continue his feud against Halaster. Either way, you carry on and proceed down another set of tunnels into the 21st level. Level 21, Terminus Level The tunnel that you follow dumps you into the 21st level, a layer filled with minecarts, rails, and failed experiments of the Mad Mage. Also known as the Deep Mines, this level of the Undermount originally revealed its riches to dwarves and later to warmongering Durgar. The Grey Dwarves have long controlled the mines, first depleting them of mithril, then excavating the iron to supply their forges. Now, Halaster's whims and depraved planar influence have surpassed the Duogar as the most dangerous inhabitants of the level. The 21st level is where Halaster dumps his failed monster experiments. Some time ago, a planetar named Fosrian slew most of these blasphemous horrors but succumbed to his own bloodlust. Fosrian is a planetar formerly in the service of Torm, god of courage and self-sacrifice. The planetar was summoned to Undermount months ago by an adventurer and cleric. Sickened by the foulness it beheld, Fosrian sought to cleanse the Terminus level of corruption, but the magic suffusing Halaster's abominations corrupted the planetar's divine zeal. The more horrors it destroyed, the more joy Fosrian took in their slaughter. Fosrian's fall from grace was swift, culminating in the murder of the clerics and her companions. The planetar now passes judgment on all who stands before it. Those who lack the willingness to sacrifice themselves for their greater end are found guilty and executed. A moat of goodness still burns within the planetar. If you can make Fosrian realize that it has become what it sought to destroy, the planetar will end itself and, with its self-sacrifice, earn Torn's forgiveness. In addition to the planetar and the failed experiments, you meet an unlikely ally. A Duragar prince named Voltigar Steel Shadow traveled to Undermountain to plunder its mine and used the wealth to buy his way back into the court of his older brother, King Horger Steel Shadow, the Deep King of Grackledstug. Voltigar's problems began years ago when he led a hunting expedition into a region of the Underdark patrolled by the drow houses of Menzo Baronson. Voltigar was captured by drow scouts and Horger was forced to pay a king's ransom in coins and slaves to free him. Hungry for vengeance, Voltiger and his followers began attacking Drow outposts, hoping to foment war between Grackelstug and Menzo Baranzen. When Drow ambassadors confronted Horger with proof of Voltiger's plot, Horger banished Voltigar and his co-conspirators. They would henceforth be known as Colossabrog, outcasts no longer welcome in Grackelstug. After long holding the deep mines, Voltigar and his Duergar followers were forced back into the Underdark by the planetar's sudden arrival and subsequent bloody crusade. Weeks after retreating, they returned to discover that the mines were much changed and even deadlier than before. The planetar slaughtered a number of Voltigar's followers until the prince stood before the planetar alone, empty-handed and daring the angel to kill him. Voltigar's gesture of self-sacrifice moved Fosrian, who judged him worthy of remaining alive. Voltigar now holds a tenuous position as Lord of the Mines, one of the Fallen Angel's advisors. Despite now being vassals of Fosrian, all the Duergar on this level remain loyal to their prince and follow Voltigar's orders without question. Voltigar intends to overthrow Fosrian, buy off the Yugalos, and seize control of the Terminus level. Towards that end, he is quick to forge alliances with you if you are also interested in bringing about the planetar's downfall. Agreeing to ally with the Duergar, you rid the level of the planetar and end its overly cruel judgment. Fosrian's death enables the Duergar to regain control of the Terminus level. Voltigar has no immediate plans other than to fortify the level and prepare for his eventual return to Grackelstug. The Yugoloths that remain make the best of a bad situation. Regardless of the outcome, the Mad Mage continues to use the Terminus level as a dumping ground for his failed monster experiments. You proceed through a secret door that is guarded by an Ultraloth and descend the stairs that lead to the 22nd level. Level 22, Shadow Dusk Hold This staircase that descends from the 21st level opens up to a grand foyer belonging to the home of a once noble family, the Shadow Dusk. The Shadow Dusk family, like many other Water Davian noble lineages, made its fortune in trading. Three sisters named Erendraya, Malween, and Yarlithra Shadowdusk became famous for sponsoring and then leading adventuring expeditions into Undermountain. One of the items they recovered from the dungeon was a tablet of black crystal that allowed contact with entities of the Far Realm. Their brother, Zirion, 
came to possess the tablet and used it to contact otherworldly beings in an attempt to destroy his family's business rivals and political enemies. This contact drove Zerion mad, and it didn't take long for the madness to spread to the other members of the Shadow Dust family and come into public view. As the family's behavior grew more bizarre, local broadsheets circulated rumors that the Shadow Dusk had been replaced by aberrant horrors in human guise. Their ancestral villa, Shadow Dusk Hold, was burned to the ground years ago. The Water Davian authorities who investigated the blaze never made their findings public, but the commonly held belief is that the city's watchful order of magist and protectors was responsible. Zirion escaped and fled to his sister's redoubt in the depths of the Undermountain. From there, he used sending spells to contact Shadow Dust family members living abroad and brought them to live with him in a twisted underground version of Shadow Dust Hold. Among those who answered the call was Margaret Shadow Dusk, a distant cousin whom Zirion would later marry. In the end, Zirion and Margaret stepped through a gateway into the far realm and were never seen again. In their absence, the torch of leadership passed to Zirion's niece and nephew, Desmir and Zalter, the twin children of his late sister Yarlithra. These former paladins of Torm abandoned their faith long ago, becoming Death Knights. Over the years, Halister Blackcloak has kept his eye on the Shadow Dusk and their plots, even as he allows the family free reign in their corner of his domain. The Mad Mage has decided that these are the kind of nobles that need to be making decisions and wielding power in Waterdeep, so that he can secretly rule the city and using them as puppets. As such, he encourages the Shadow Dust to consolidate power in preparation for a triumphant and bloody return to Waterdeep, after which Halister will seize power as the city's Shadow Lord. The Shadow Dust family motto used to be No Secrets Without Truth. After the family's fall, its motto changed to We Do Not Fear the Darkness. The family's crest was a lit torch with three embers rising from the flame, set against a purple background. In the wake of the family's descent into Undermountain and Madness, this crest had literally turned upside down so that the torch flame points downward. Your journey through this level brings you face to face with the current leader of the Shadow Dust Hold, Zalthar and Desmir. Deeming them too great of a threat to live, you battle through their minions and eventually slay the two along with their family. While certainly a noble cause, it may be for naught. When Zalthar and Desmir are destroyed, they eventually reform as Death Knights. Their ambition and hatred burn too fiercely for them to be able to give up their dreams of conquest, and they are too corrupted by the Far Realm to be redeemed. When they return to find the rest of their family destroyed, the Death Knights expand their hatred to include you. Out of desperation, the twins try to forge alliances with the other denizens of Undermountain, such as the Jarl of House Avrindar or House Freth, and the Mind Flayers of Sea Deeps, or the Cult of Shar and Van Raktum. If no such allies remain, Desmir and Zathar look deep into the Underdark and the Far Realm, drawing forth aberrant horrors by offering them promises of a new life in the Undermountain. Regardless of the outcomes that unfolds, you make your way to the last passage into the Undermountain. No longer will you descend any tunnels, for the last path into the furthest depths of the Undermountain is an arch gate, beckoning a sacrifice of a magical item. Placing any magical item that you found in the dungeon activates the gate allowing you to step through onto the 23rd and final level of the Undermountain. Level 23, Mad Wizard Slayer Stepping through the Archgate, you finally made it into the Mad Wizard Slayer, the final level of the Undermountain. Here you find Halister, along with the Mad Mage's two apprentices, Arcturia and Trobriand. Having made it this far, Halister is equal parts impressed and curious, he is ready to grant you an audience, having kept an eye on your progress. True to the nature that earned him the moniker, Mad Mage, Halister's demeanor towards you changes on a whim. He alternates between seeming furious, baffled, annoyed, amused, or simply bored. If you and your actions support Halister's current goals, the Mad Mage is not necessarily hostile. The apprentices, Octuria and Trobrian, on the other hand, may be incredibly hostile depending on your actions in the Undermountain. Arcturia is a lich and a master of transmutation magic. She has altered her form dramatically over the years, now appearing more alive than undead. Gossamer wings sprout from her shoulders, and bone spurs jut from her forearms and elbows. Having destroyed her phylactery on the 14th level, Arcturia attacks you on sight. While a difficult battle, her defeat means she will no longer reanimate with the loss of her phylactery. The other apprentice, Trobrian, the metal mage, specializes in the creation of magical constructs. Having passed through the upper levels, you've certainly encountered some of his creations. Fed up with the frailty of flesh, 
Trobrian has transferred his spirit into the body of a specially prepared iron golem. This merging of spirit and metal has done nothing to improve his sanity, however. Traversing the Mad Mage's lair proves to be a difficult feat, but it does not stop you from entering Halster's tower. Your exploration of that tower takes you to a door that emanates a sinister aura. A warning in your mind shouts, The Mad Mage waits for you beyond the next door. Prepare yourselves. Opening the door, you are greeted by the throne room of Halister Blackcloak. It doesn't take long before a battle commences. Halister summons Nakara, the daughter of the Frost Maiden Oral, to fight you. Swords and spells are exchanged, and a long-fought battle is had before the dust fades and you stand victorious. Halister congratulates you on the final test before he reveals himself sitting on the throne. One final battle commences between you and Halister. In the end, the Mad Mage falls, hopefully never to return. With Halister killed, the demiplane around his tower collapses without warning. As the tower is torn asunder, its content are blasted into the far corners of the astral plane. You barely manage to make it out of the tower and, eventually, out of the Undermount and back to the Yawning Portal. The patrons of the Yawning Portal hail you as a hero, but it doesn't take too long for a new evil to claim the Undermount. Hello everybody! Boy, that was a very long read. Quite a mega dungeon, that one. Currently, this is uh, my longest video yet, so as much as I would like to detail each level, I had to make them short. There's no way I could have managed to make them longer, because this video was like already over an hour long. It was certainly a lot of work, but I'm glad to have read it. Mega dungeons aren't usually my cup of tea. Since I view Dungeons and Dragons as more of a role-playing game than like a dungeon delve, strange, isn't it? Having said that, it was really cool to read this and find plenty of opportunity for role-playing. Yeah, a lot of it was classical dungeon stuff, but I'm very glad they added a, a lot of scenarios in which you can roleplay. Kudos for them for putting in so much work into like this 300 page mega dungeon. If you liked my video, do give it a like and subscribe. These videos take quite a bit of time to make. With that, hopefully you enjoyed the rest of your day and appreciate you watching my video. Thanks!